guys want to okay. just introduce yourself and you spell your names. Names and spellings and titles and all that good, good stuff. Bernie. Yeah, I'm uh, Bernie Bilski, B-I-L-S-K-I. Rand, R a a Rand, R-A-N-D, Warsaw, to be A-R-S-A-W. Could you guys tell us in a nutshell what you invented? The, the invention is a guaranteed energy bill, which is like a budget bill without a true up. And it's a method of hedging both sides in the transaction. So behind giving consumers, energy consumers, a guaranteed energy bill, there's a lot of mechanics. And the mechanics involve financial transactions between energy consumption or any energy consumers and the energy providers. And that's what the invention is in a nutshell. It's a method of generating uh, guaranteed bills for consumers and also protecting energy company earnings. The Bilski case itself is someone applied for a patent on a business method or software and the patent office rejected it. And now this is that person suing the patent office saying you have to grant me that patent. This case is about what does it mean to be a patentable process. And so since software patents fall under the category of processes because they're not the machine and they're not a composition of matter, which are some of the other categories of things that are patentable, this case will define what it means to be a patentable process. What about Justice Roberts? He said, you know, basically your patent involves people picking up the phone and calling other people. It could be reduced to that level as the certain acts that are performed, but it's much more than that. It has to do with selling a commodity at a fixed price to one party, selling uh, to a different party at a different fixed price, identifying counter risk positions. If you look at claim four in the patent, we have things called claims which describe really what the invention is. There's a long mathematical formula in there that it didn't exist in nature or, or anywhere in the literature that these very inventive folks came up with. Once upon a time, math was not patentable, and now it is. Yeah, and, and we can have somebody like Bilski coming in and saying, yes, uh, you know, I worked hard on this mathematical equation, and therefore I, sh I should have a patent on this information processing method here. You mentioned in your claim that there's a very long calculation shown there. There is. Do you think a strong calculation or good math is a basis for a, for a patent? It can be. The basic process of, of writing software is you take a broad algorithm of some sort, so, you know, some means of doing something with abstract data, and then you, you apply variable names. So for our first derivation, let's start with just a simple matrix, uh, a matrix of values. And we'll, we'll find the mean of each column, mean mu, mu, mu 1, mu 2, mu 3. And we're going to find define y to be x minus x, uh, I'm sorry, x minus mu for each column. Now if we have some, some other vector, x, we can take x dot s and find the projection of x onto this space. This is called a singular value decomposition. Now, here's the trick. Here's the great part. Now, let's say in, in, let's say this first row, x1, equals uh, sexuality. Let's say x2 equals, uh, do you own cats? And x3 equals, I don't know, uh, affectionateness. OK, so now we'll also say that, that let, let, let's take a vector uh, J1 equals Jane. Jane's responses on this, uh, on this survey. Let's say J2 equals Joe's responses. Now let's do the same projection as we did before. We're going to take X dot S, we're going to take J1 dot S. We're going to take, subtract that from J2 dot S. We're going to find the distance between these two points. And we're going to call that compatibility. And in that simple step, we have derived patent number 6,735,568. Uh, the, trick, the trick of our derivation was that before, with the singular value decomposition, we had abstract numbers. What the guys at eHarmony did to get this patent was to assign names to our variables. So instead of just an abstract x1, we have sexuality. Instead of an abstract x2, we have a preference for cats. And by making those assignments, by setting variable names in this manner, they were able to take an abstract concept and to turn it into a patentable device. What we want to do, uh, according to the, the, you know, the, the heads of, of our patent institutions, 
is take mathematics and slice it up into as many slices as possible and hand those slices out and say, well, if you do a principal component analysis, if you multiply matrices for, uh, for dating sites, well, okay, you can, we'll give that to eHarmony. Uh, if it's for equities, we'll get that to State Street, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, what we're giving out is basically exclusive rights to use mathematics, to use a law of nature in whatever context. And what we're getting in return is basically nothing. The patents is a government grant in the U.S. It uh, arises out of the Constitution. The framers included the provision for granting exclusive rights to inventors in our Constitution, and the, the belief was that that was important in order to reward people who had made technological advances that would benefit society. The rights that they are granted are not the rights to do the thing that they, they, they invent, but the, the right to exclude others from doing that thing. So the idea was you have a machine or a thing which is not previously described in any literature and which no skilled mechanic could figure out how to make given what is described in the literature and for that you get a patent. The, the, the basis for determining what is patentable subject matter has continued to evolve over the last 200 years of our, our national existence. In 1953, the Patent Act was modified by Congress to add the words or processes to the word product in describing what could be patented. The Congress which did that was plainly thinking about processes of industrial manufacture, processes that produced something at the other end. Float glass on molten tin and it will become flat or whatever. And it's unlikely that anybody thought of process at that time in terms of computer software because we didn't uh, have applications on computer software for uh, many years after the, that uh, the last revision of the Patent Act. Back in the late 70s, the patent law was interpreted such that you couldn't patent software. It was considered a mathematical algorithm, a law of nature. The legal uh, world changed. Uh, the environment was quite different, starting with some, um, some uh, decisions by the Supreme Court, like Diamond v. Deere. The, um, the patent applicant was coming in with a new process for curing rubber. The temperature and the preciseness of the temperature is essential in, in, in curing rubber well. And the innovation that was being patented in this case was, um, was a, a, an algorithm to monitor a thermometer that, that was basically in the process and determined when the rubber needed to be released um, and cooled. And they said processes for curing rubber are patentable. There's nothing new about that. The fact that they use a computer in implementing it shouldn't change anything. The Supreme Court makes it clear that you cannot patent software because it is only a set of instructions or an algorithm. And uh, abstract laws of nature, algorithms are unpatentable in the U.S. itself. And um, however, there is, then there was the creation of the Court uh, of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. The problem being solved in some sense begins with the fact that trial court judges always hate patent cases. And the reason the trial court judges hate patent cases is for a single trial judge, a lawyer who has spent his or her life doing litigation, a patent case in which she or he is going to be required to find detailed facts about how paint is made or how computers work or how radio broadcasting operates is an opportunity just to be made into a fool. Congress is attempting to change the system in which patent cases are litigated. 
But instead of changing who tried patent cases, Congress left the non-specialist district judge in charge of the trial and then created a new court of appeals called the Federal Circuit, whose job it was to hear all appeals from patent cases. Rapidly, of course, this court filled up with patent lawyers. And the patent lawyers then made the law in the Court of Appeals that applied to all those district judges who were still making non-specialist decisions of which they were afraid. Naturally, the Federal Circuit turned out to be a place which loved patents. And its chief judge, Giles Rich, who lived to be very, very old and died in his late 90s, was a man who particularly loved patents on everything. The Federal Circuit Court under Giles Rich sort of broke diamond against deer loose from its original meaning and came to the conclusion that software itself could be patented. The Supreme Court basically left everything to this court to decide. The PTO actually used to reject patents on software like in the early 1990s and they did not allow them and the applicants would appeal those rejections to the Federal Circuit. In the world of machines, you showed the patent office the machine, and you got a patent office whose claims were, I claim this machine. In the world of computer software, there was no way of defining what the unit was. I don't claim a program, I claim a technique that any number of programs doing any number of things could possibly use. The consequence of which is that very rapidly we began to build up as real estate that somebody owned and could exclude other people from a whole lot of basic techniques in computer programming. What happened was, starting in the mid-90s, the, the numbers of patents on software started soaring. Uh, and industry attitudes started changing, too. So you had Microsoft, which originally didn't deal with software patents very much at all. I guess they got sued in the early 90s by Stack and lost a uh, significant judgment against them. They started patenting. They're going to have their own their own set of patents, so that if a major patent holder threatens them, they can fire back. Gradually, companies like Oracle were forced to set up patent departments just for defensive reasons. They had to patent their stuff so that they had something to trade with the companies that had patents. And so the arsenals start to develop. And by the two thousand, you know, year two thousand, two thousand one, Microsoft now holds you know, thousands of software patents. Oracle was probably approaching a thousand software patents, Adobe. And all of them have become more and more aggressive patenters, and some of the ones who were against software patents ended up suing other companies. And, and so you, you, what, you, what you've had is an explosion of patenting first, and then an explosion of litigation. By the late 90s, uh, about a quarter of all patents granted were software patents. Uh, about a third of all litigation, patent litigation, involves software patents. About 40% of the cost of litigation is attributable to software patents. And those numbers have been going up. So uh, Charles Freeney invented a, a kiosk that goes in retail stores. Uh, and the idea is you'd come in, you could s select the music selection, swipe your credit card, put in a blank nine-track tape, and this is, this is how long ago this patent was. Uh, and it would write that music selection onto the tape and you could go away with it. Uh, the patent was drafted in a very, you know, this very vague language, so there, was, there were terms like point of sale location and information manufacturing machine, and uh, 